Stand up on your feet. Now you got the hang of playing your hands right to the side. Yeah, stay with that groove. Even better. Yeah. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Oh, we shine on your breath. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shine on your prayer. Oh, there's a joy in this place. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on the cross Then he rose up from the grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord Yeah If the Lord today we won't be quiet We shine out your prayer There's a joy yeah When the God is surely We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's declare it, folks. We were the beggars, yeah, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's join it. Let's sing it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shine up. There's a joy, yeah. Oh, our God is surely in this way. Oh, we shine up. There's joy in the house. There's a joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shine so the Lord, our God is truly in this place. We won't be quiet. We shine on your place. There's a joy, there's a joy in this place. Oh, we shine on your place. Cross the bed. 
Let's pray together. Most gracious God, we just sang the word, your goodness is running after us. So Lord, I pray that all the things that we think is better, that we hold on to in our own lives, Lord, I pray we just lose our grip on those things. I pray, Lord, we just let those things go because they're not better than knowing you and living our lives completely devoted to you. Lord, I pray students and adults alike tonight, Lord, we trust you, we love you and follow you and live long lives of faithful obedience to you, O oh God. We pray that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you guys give it up for the band? They've done an awesome job this week. Do you want to know why Camp Paradise is better than every other student band or student camp in the whole country? Do you want to know why? It's because the Harris Creek Band. I mean, think about it. Not only are they like supremely talented and some of the best worship leaders on the face of the planet and in history, but... What's really, really cool for you guys is that tomorrow morning when we go to church, you will see Gerald on stage. You'll see Jordan on stage. You'll see Melissa and Olivia. You'll see Van and Andrew playing the instruments in the back. The only thing different will be that John, Olivia, and Gerald won't be wearing a ball cap at church. So like this is, I mean, it is really special for you guys to see them love you enough to, I mean, guys, they, they take time away from their family, from their kids, from their wives to be here. That's a, you don't know it, but that's a sacrifice. And so you guys, make sure you, you show your appreciation to the band, and especially... <laughs> and you didn't even know that Campbell Benfield was, like, super talented on the bass. I mean, coming out of nowhere. Come on. All right. If you got your Bible, go ahead and turn it to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 23, all right? All right, Luke chapter 9, as we, to use a NASCAR illustration, as we come around turn four and we look to the finish line of tomorrow after church in this camp, I want us to camp out in these three verses in Luke chapter 9 and let us really consider what, what's the next step for me? What, what, is, what is God calling me to do following Camp Paradise 2021? So, if you have Luke chapter 9, verse 23, how about we stand tonight? Would you guys stand as we read Luke chapter 9? Hey, Corey, what am I supposed to say? We going live? We're going live. All right, you guys ready? Let's read Luke chapter 9. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever, who, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Let's stop there and let's pray. God, I'm asking that you would use these verses, that you would use my voice to minister the heart of these people, to minister to my own heart. God, I pray that you would call us into deeper discipleship with you. I pray that you would call us to a life of following Christ Jesus in his name we pray, amen. You guys can sit down. This passage has been just personally like instrumental in my own life uh, when I was about your age and into college. These verses really stuck with me for whatever reason. And tonight I wanted to preach these for us as a student ministry so that we would take discipleship and following Jesus seriously. And if I were to give you an overarching theme for tonight, it would be this, following Jesus is costly and worth it. Following Jesus is costly and worth it. You know, last night I kind of did it unconventionally, and I think I said we were going to water wreck through the passage and just kind of dabble here, dabble there. I'm going to go a little more old school. I got three points for you guys. So we got three points. I got two Hobbit movie references, and we're going to have one good night, all right? So point number one. You guys ready for point number one? Say, uh-huh. Following Jesus is an open invite. Following Jesus is an open invite. Look with me to verse 23. And Jesus said to all, all, okay? See the all? Who's the all that Jesus is talking about? 
Well, yeah, everyone, yeah, very good. If we were to look at the context specifically of John chapter 9, uh, for me, I just need to look to the page to the left, and I can see that in John chapter nine, or Luke chapter 9, verse 10, Jesus is feeding the 5,000. So there's this big, giant crowd uh, with Jesus. That's who he's talking to. Also in there, we can assume that his disciples, his posse is in there, like the 12 apostles. We could probably assume that some of the, the women followers, like Mary and the other Mary and Salome, were probably there as well. And so he is speaking to all these people, and he said, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would come after me, think about who's in this crowd, thousands of people. They are old and young. They are healthy and not healthy. They are smart and not smart. They are decently good people, respectable in society. They are probably crummy bad people as well. They are white. They are brown. They are black. They are yellow. Like they are all sorts of people in this crowd. And Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, anyone, to, to say it another way, you, you don't have to be a certain way. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to come from a, a perfect family where your parents are still married to come after Jesus. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Jesus. You don't have to fix yourself and be a good Christian who's read their Bible the whole way through before you come to Jesus. No, the invitation is anyone. If anyone would come after me. But let's think about those disciples for a second. Jesus has invited all these people to come to him. All, they're looking around like, hey, Jesus, they haven't done what we've done the, the first eight chapters, Jesus. Like, if we were to go rewind and look through chapter five, let's do that real quick. Look at chapter five, verse 11. Jesus has called uh, some of the disciples. He said, hey, go put your net on the other side of the boat. You're going to catch a ton of fish. They do. They're like, whoa, who is this guy? Look at verse 11. And when they brought their boats to the land, they, being some of the disciples, they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. Look at verse 27. We're going to see Jesus calling Levi. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, Levi arose and followed him. These disciples in Luke chapter 9 now, this crowd, Jesus is saying, if anyone would come after me, follow me. These disciples are probably thinking, hey, Jesus, we've already done that. What about us? Hey, Jesus, we've, we've, we've been doing that. We've been with you since day one, bro. Like, what a, what a, you forget about us? Are we not good enough? And I think the invitation for uh, those of us who maybe would identify with the disciples there, hey, I've, I've already like left my lifestyle, Jesus, I've, I, my former lifestyle, I've already followed you. I think the invitation for us is still to continue following Christ, to grow deeper in our discipleship, to grow in a closer union with Christ. This is... Um, this is an important thing for us to remember because, yes, it is an open invite, but the call to follow Christ is an ongoing invite as well. So this is what it looks like to follow Christ. Let's look at, let's look at point number two. Following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is costly. All right, let's read verse 23. And as I do, you're going to see... You're going to see three verbs about what it looks like to come after Jesus, okay? Look at it. If anyone would come after me, here they are, let him, one, deny himself, and two, take up his cross daily, and three, follow me. Deny, take up your cross, follow. These three verbs Jesus offers to these people, and let's think about it. This is a really tough ask. This is a big ask. This is a difficult decision for these disciples. I mean, as we saw, some of them had already left everything. For some of these crowds, all these people are going to be watching them if, if they step out in faith and start to follow Jesus. People are going to think, what is my friend going to think of me if, if, if I do this? What's my family going to think if I kind of go against what they think is right and good for me? Because not all that crowd was coming to follow Jesus. Some of them were coming for almost plainly put, like they were just kind of coming for the freak show. They wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to see Jesus bring a storm or stop a storm. They wanted to see him multiply bread, which he did, right? Some of them were just coming for the spectacle. They weren't coming to know God. And so to deny yourself, to take up your cross, to follow Jesus, the homeless man, the man in everyone's mind was born out of wedlock, like to that, that man, like that's who you're going to go follow? Like this was a big ask of those society, that society, 
of that crowd, of those people. And what I love about Jesus is he is not afraid to say it. I mean, in another sense, like Jesus, I just imagine them always in the desert. Like, do you guys do that too? Right? Like just the, where they are geographically in the world, just everything is du- dust and dirt. So I just imagine Jesus like taking his foot and like drawing a line in the sand, looking at the crowd and said, okay, you guys want to come for the spectacle and everything, but like the easy road stops at this line. If you want to really follow me, like take a, take a step across that line and really step out in faith. The easy road is done. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, let's go. We got work to do. But if you just want to be a part of the crowd, stay over there. I think Jesus is giving us a really big invitation in our lives to follow him, to step out in faith and to, to answer to this big ask. You know, to, to follow somebody, we really must know them as well, which we spent a lot of time on yesterday with the good shepherd and how to be known by God is to be loved by God and to know God ourselves is to love God ourselves. So to follow, we must know. And I just want to say this. I meant to say it last night. We can know Christ because he is revealed in scripture and manifested in the church. We can read the Bible and, and learn who Christ is. We can learn who, read the gospels. Man, like Matthew through John are some of the best books in all of history. They're, they're some of the best books of the Bible because they show us the very nature of Jesus on earth and him rescuing us. So he is re- revealed in scripture, but he's also manifested in the church. We're like, as the body of Christ, you've heard that uh, metaphor a lot, as the body of Christ, the church is supposed to be the ones that are loving to neighbor. The church is supposed to be the one that are serving the outsider. The church is supposed to be the one that stands up in the face of adversity, right? So manifested, look at the church. And Jesus is asking us to follow him and to know him. Another thing that I want to point out, third one. Following Jesus is worth it. Following Jesus is worth it. And I'm going to spend a lot of time here in verse 24. Okay? For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Let me read that again because it's a little confusing. For whoever would save his life will lose it. So if you think you, you know what's right for you, if you think that you know how to earn salvation, if you think you know what is good, if you think that you can be in charge of your life, Jesus is saying, if you put your effort in that, you're going to lose it. On the opposite, though, it says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And this is really opposite of how the world thinks. This is really contrary to our society. And it's even contrary to the disciples because in verse 23, this idea of taking up your cross daily, the instrument that is used for murdering like uh, criminals and things like that, like that very instrument that's used for murder and death, I'm supposed to carry that around and follow you? Like this is really confusing for the disciples and uh, for the crowd. And it's confusing for us too because the world tells us, hey, you need to do what's best for you. Hey, you, you know what's good for you. You need to do that. You need to chase your dreams. You need to make your name great. You need to, you need to be, the, be the one that people look up to. And some of those are, are good principles maybe. But the, the idea that we get from Jesus in verse 24 is much different. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And then I just, I just, I got to ask the question, how does Jacob live in such a way? How can I live in such a way? How can I, how can I do this? This is, a, this is a really big ask. This is a really confusing task because it doesn't make sense to my mortal mind. So how, how, do, we, how do we live in such a way? And this is my Hobbit reference number one. Okay. Uh, has anybody seen the Hobbit movies? I'm talking about the movies. I've read the books too, but I'm going to talk about the movies for just a few of us. Okay, let me paint this for you. In the Hobbit... It's part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In, in, in The Hobbit, I guess there's four books, so it kind of like precedes the trilogy because that's three. But in The Hobbit, the story is there's a, a, a oh, what is Bil- Bobo? He is a, guys, look, you think that I'm like cool on stage and like my mind is empty a lot of times. He's a hobbit, okay? He's a simpleton. Like he, he likes to just eat vegetables and read books and chill at home, okay? He's a hobbit. He's a simpleton. 
And he is hired as a burglar with these dwarves. And these dwarves are fearless creatures. Think of like Vikings, okay? This, that's what these dwarves are. And so these dwarves are going to go and kind of take back their castle that was lost long, long ago to a dragon. So they go and they, and they do it. And, and I don't want to ruin the, the, the next reference later. But they go and, and they conquer uh, the dragon. And there's this big battle with all these five armies. And at the end of the movie, this is not so well depicted in the book, but at the end of the movie... Uh, there, there's somebody who dies. I'm not going to tell you who because that would ruin everything. But there's somebody that dies. And it, it's a really gruesome. I mean, it's a PG-13 movie, so I feel comfortable sharing it with you guys. That's kind of my rule. I don't share anything other than PG-13. But this guy, he's, he is dying. And Bil, uh, Bilbo Baggins runs over to him, and he's holding him like as he's saying his final words. And it's a really, really powerful quote when you think about it through a Christian lens. And on his deathbed, his last words to Bilbo Baggins are this. If more people valued home above gold, the world would be a much merrier place. So what does it look like for Christians to live in such a way that we would deny or lose our life in order to save it? Guys, we, we must value home above gold. I ain't talking about your lazy boy. I ain't talking about your Xbox. Guys, Christians must value our home in heaven, the, the place where our residence resides. We must value that life above gold, above what this world offers, above athletic success, above scholarships, above academics, above people's approval, above a, a job when I'm 15, above a, a good college acceptance. We must value home above all, all else if we're going to lose our life in order to save it. Let us take the mind of, of Bilbo Baggins and, and value our heavenly home above what this world can offer because it will leave us completely thirsty as we talked about on night one. And as we fix our eyes on heaven, let us fix our eyes and hearts on Christ above all. And this is what I love about Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Uh, you don't have to flip there because, boy, Phil's going to put it on the screen real quick. This is what it says. Acts 20, verse 24, but I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Do you hear what Paul said? But I do not account my life of any value, nor precious to myself, if only I may do one thing, if only I may live for the Lord Jesus and the ministry that he has placed on my heart. I don't care about my life here on this earth because I'm going to have a better life to come. And this verse has re resonated through Christian history ever since it was written. And I want to introduce you to a brother of mine. His name is Adoniram Judson. Do we got a picture of him, Phil? Maybe? As you can tell, we have different moms. We don't look that alike. Okay? This is my brother. His name is Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to the people of Burma in the 1800s. And Adoniram Judson, uh, he, he was like the first missionary, and he translated the Bible from English to their Burmese language, and, and God has moved in that people since then to bring many of them to salvation. They had never heard of the name of Jesus until Adoniram Judson and his family went. And Adoniram Judson, as he valued life with God above all else, as he valued the call uh, to follow Christ above all else, and, and desiring to propose to his wife, Anne, his first wife, Anne, he wrote her father a letter. And I read this a few years at Camp Paradise, but it was like five years ago, so many of you weren't here. And none of us were actually here. But in, in writing to her father for his permission to propose to Anne and to move to Burma, this is what he said. It's going to be on the screen, and it's a lengthy quote, but I love what it articulates, okay? I have now to ask whether you can consent, whether you can agree to part with your daughter early next spring and to see her no more in this world whether you can agree to her departure, to her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, because they're going to sail across the Atlantic, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to get degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps even a violent death. Can, this is where it gets good, y'all. Can you consent to all of this Watch it, watch it. He's going to lose his life in order to gain it. 
for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God. Can you consent to all of this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness, brighten with the acclamation of praise, which shall resound to her savior from heaven, heathen saved through her means and from eternal woe and despair. Do you guys hear the heart of Adoniram as he is going to risk it all in this life to gain a much better life by following Jesus? Amen. That there would be many in the people of Burma, and there were many in the people of Burma, Myanmar today, that would come to faith through his ministry and would have a seat in the heavenly home next to him, next to his wife Anne, next to her dad who gave him permission to do this. Right, guys, are we, are we as an Hickory Grove student ministry willing to, to risk it all to do something like that? I often pray, and I know Blake does too, I often pray that God would call many of us to ministry in this room. Like, what if the next Billy Graham was sitting in these chairs? What if the next Lottie Moon, who went to China, was sitting in these chairs? What if the next Adoniram or Ann Judson was, was from one of you? What if the next Jackie Hill Perry or Jen Wilkin or Charles Spurgeon came from Hickory Grove basement and loft? Well, are we willing as a family of Hickory Grove students to give our lives to Christ, to follow him with our whole selves, knowing that we would gain a much richer life with the joy that we talked about yesterday? Who from here will, get, will give themselves to such a joyous life by giving their whole life to the gospel? And I want to apply this a little bit more in a way that's maybe more relevant for right now. You guys are 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up to 18. How do we take that first step right now? And this is where I want to camp out for just a second in verse 25. Let's look at verse 25. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What does it profit a man? And if he gains all the riches of the world, all, all the accolades of the world that it has to offer, and yet loses or forfeits himself? I love Camp Paradise. I really love retreating with you guys. I love sweating at Lanarek. I love eating crummy food. I like sleeping with a wooden bar in the middle of my back with you guys. I love water wreck and getting lake water up my nose and in my ears. Like I love singing with you guys. I love hearing you sing. I love late night. Like I love Camp Paradise. But do you want to know one of the most frustrating things about a student pastor when it comes to Camp Paradise? It's, it's this, and it happens every year is this, this flow of thought. You ready? We're at Camp Paradise, and I see God moving in your lives. I see you singing with smiles on your face. I see you having conversations and being real honest and vulnerable. I feel God really pulling you forward. And then we go home. And in just a few weeks, we're going to start school. I'm sorry to say, tell, you, tell you that, but we're going to start school in just a few weeks. And what's going to happen is many of us are going to give our lives to academics. We're going to give our lives to extracurriculars. <coughs> And we're, we're going to say this as Melissa, Jacob, Ali, Blake, we're, we're going to say this, hey, come join us for discipleship. Hey, come be a part of the student ministry. And you're going to look at us and say, I, I can't. I got too much schoolwork. I'm up till midnight doing homework. I got soccer practice after school, and then I got to go home and eat dinner before I start homework at 9 o'clock. And I just, Jacob, I, I can't commit to that. Like, that's just, that's just too much. And I'm like, man, like, rem remember Camp Paradise just a few, few weeks ago? Honestly, what I want to do is echo Coach Boone from the Remember, remember the Titans in my movie. Remember when Petey fumbles the football at football camp? <laughs> You're killing me, Petey! Like, that's how I feel. Like, you guys are killing me. You want to risk discipleship? You want to risk your soul for academic success? What if we turn verse 25 around real quick? What if verse 25 said, for whoever, oh, nope, sorry, that's 26. For what does it profit a student if he has a 4.0 GPA in college acceptance and loses or forfeits himself? For what does it profit a student to have scholarship and AP class credits and all these course credits when he graduates high school if he forfeits and loses himself? Guys, is that, is that what we're going to be marked by? Are we going to be defined by our academics? I realize for you seniors that just graduated, this is almost a lost cause. But for, but for some of you juniors going into senior year, this is real relevant. And some of you sophomores going to junior year, I'm especially speaking to you. Is it really worth taking five, six, seven AP classes if you're not going to be a part of discipleship and grow as a Christian? 
Is it, is it worth playing soccer? This is my life. Is it worth playing club soccer, having workouts every day of the week and night practice every other day of the week in addition to like club and school soccer? Is it worth all that if you're not growing as a Christian? Guys, those are, those are tough decisions to make. It was, it was tough for me to tell my parents, hey, I don't want to play soccer anymore. But guys, it is so worth it if it means that we get to be discipled. It is so worth it if it means that my relationship with God gets to grow. It is so worth it if I get to see you grow in Christ's likeness, to love God's word, to be marked by grace, to be a person of forgiveness. Guys, it is so worth it for us to make these sacrifices for something much better. Because your school administration, because a society is going to tell you that if you don't graduate high school with 18 AP credits, you're behind in college. They're going to tell you if you don't get into that school or that school or that school, then you're, you're not going to make it in this world. They're going to tell you that if you don't get the, the best kind of degree from the best school and get the best job, you won't be able to provide for your family. And if you don't, aren't able to provide for your family, then your wife won't love you and your kids won't love you. That, that's kind of like what our world says, is it not? And God is so much better than that. Because if he's going to feed the birds of the air, if he's going to clothe the flowers of the field, is he not going to take care of you if you go to CPCC? Is he not going to take care of you if you don't, if you're in college for four years instead of only three because you took so many AP classes? Is he not going to take care of you if you don't take any AP classes at all, but you give all your time to the student ministry? Guys, he will, he will care abundantly more for you to follow him and to deny yourself, to deny those temptations and to deny those ambitions in order for the sake of you growing as a disciple. This is the call of Jesus. I told you, Jesus is drawing a line through the sand and he's asking you to lay stuff down to come and follow him. And this is, this is what I think is the best part. All right, you ready for your Hobbit reference number two? I told you I had to. All right, so I, I kind of told you about the battle, right? I, I told you about the battle of the five armies. There's a group of people that go and take over the castle and uh, then all these other people are trying to take what's inside the castle. It's a bunch of gold. And uh, there's one po pocket of people, and then there's four other armies. And the pocket of people that uh, have possession of the castle and all the gold inside are just hunkering down. And they're like, no, let them fight amongst themselves. We're going to stay right here. One of those other, other, other armies was actually like their brother dwarf army. So it's like their cousins and stuff. And they're getting demolished. Like they're straight up getting beat. Like th these other dwarves are just getting like, are they the northern dwarves? What is it? I don't care. Like they're <laughs> Iron Mountains. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, so they're just getting destroyed by like the elves and like the orcs and all this kind of stuff. And there's this moment. There's this moment where the king inside the castle, he comes to his senses and he leaves the castle with his, his group of 12 behind him. And he starts fighting alongside his, his uh, brother dwarves and like cousin dwarves. And Bilbo Baggins, he's with Gandalf, who's like the, the wizard guy with the staff and the beard and the hair and the hat. And they're like, look, the dwarves are, are they're rallying. They're rallying. Look, they're making a comeback. And Gandalf's like, no, Bilbo. They're rallying to their king. And it's this like big moment where uh, Orkin, Oaken Shield is like running out there and just like slaying all these people. And like they really make this like kind of David and Goliath comeback on these orcs and all these bad guys. And it's like this really heroic scene. And what I love about that, it gives us a really good picture of verse 25. Because verse 25 gives us a really good picture of what Christ did for us. Guys, Jesus is not asking you to do something he wasn't willing to do himself. Guys, when Jesus says, take up his cross daily and follow him, he's thinking, I'm doing that at Golgotha. The disciples don't know that, but Jesus does. When he's saying, hey, come and lose your life for my sake and it will be saved, Jesus, Jesus knows that in just a few chapters... He's, he's pouring out every blood, every drop of blood for his sheep. And so guys, let us as disciples, we're not in it alone, right? When we cross the line, we're not on our own. No, we cross the line and we are rallying to the king, joining him on mission, the mission of making disciples in Charlotte and North Carolina and to the ends of the earth. Guys, we have a king who's willing to do this and, and let us follow him into battle in a sense. Let us follow him in this life. And so that's my second Hobbit reference for you tonight, and as I kind of begin to come to a close, I, I, I guess I am specifically asking you to follow the king, to give your life to him, to make these sacrifices, to lay aside your ambitions, to deny 
your ambitions, verse 23. To take up your cross, knowing that people are going to look at you. Take up your cross, knowing that you have died to sin and you can live to Christ and follow him. He's the good shepherd. He will guide you. You ain't got to be alone. You are his sheep. He will watch over you. He'll protect you like we talked about yesterday. Guys, follow the king. And tonight, I want, to, I want us to consider, I want us to consider what our next steps are as we look to follow the king. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the band to come up here, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and bow your head. This is the last night of Camp Paradise, and I want us all to walk away with a step of obedience. I want us all, you, imagine you were standing in front of a line and drawn in the sand, and Jesus is on the other side of that line, and he's asking you to follow him. And you might be thinking, Jay, this has been a really fun camp. I really do feel like God's growing in my life. Well, what should I do next? What does it look like for me to follow him? I got, I got three options, okay? Three options for you guys. Option number one, you need to really consider what life adjustment do you need to make? Maybe it's breaking up with that boyfriend or that girlfriend because honestly, that relationship's not growing you in Christ likeness. Maybe you, you need to clean out your Spotify because you listen to trash music. Maybe you need new friends because those that you have are gossipy, they're evil, they're wicked, they, they cause a lot of drama, they're hateful, they're unforgiving. Maybe you need to go find new friends. Maybe if you were like me when I was in high school, you need to quit sports. Maybe you need to be quitting sports to join the student ministry with your whole heart. So that, that's option number one. Maybe that's you. Another one is baptism. A lot of you are interested in baptism. And something I didn't know before this week is a lot of you are scared to be baptized. With every eye, with every eye closed and your head's bowed, if that's you, because I'm, I'm not going to ask people to look at you because I know that you're already kind of scared. If you would say, hey, Jacob, I, I'm pretty sure that I'm a Christian. I, I, I love the gospel. I believe in Jesus to save me from sin. I believe he's my only way to heaven. I know I should be baptized. I know it's not magical. It's not supernatural. It's just a symbol. I know these things, Jacob, but I'm just really nervous. I'm real scared about being in front of the church. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I know I want to be baptized. I'm just really scared. Hey, look, that's a, that simple hand is a good hand. It's a simple step of obedience. You can put your hand down. It's a simple step of obedience. I would love to talk to you about baptism and how I can create an environment where you are willing to follow Jesus. There's a third invitation for you tonight too. So you might be in group number one, you might be in group number two, or you might be in this third group. I wanna ask this, and, and Blake agrees with me in this, we wanna gauge where our student ministry is. We talked about Adoniram Judson, we talked about the severe life of following Jesus Maybe this week or maybe for some time, you have felt God calling you to something greater than just discipleship. You feel like he's calling you to give you your whole life in ministry. What I mean by that is you feel like God is calling you to be a pastor or, or a teacher or a, an Ali or a Melissa type of person or maybe a missionary. You want to be like Adoniram Judson or Brian and Becky Harrell. Right, you, you want to give your life to something like that. I love verse 26. Just listen to me as I read verse 26. It says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. Guys, the call to ministry is not something I want to take lightly with students. It's not something I want to take lightly myself. I'm not saying I have all the answers when I say this. I'm not saying when you step forward and say, hey, I feel called to ministry that you're going to have all the answers either. In fact, you're going to wrestle a whole lot. I, I wrestle a whole lot. In fact, here's a real-time example. I am, I'm a pastor. You guys look at me. I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm the youngest pastor at Hickory Grove. There's a lot of pastors here that I look up to. In a moment, I'm, I'm going to give a very public invitation. And I, my insecurity says that the success of this invitation rests on how you as students respond. And I have other pastors that I look up to watching this. And my insecurity tells me that my success as a pastor rests on how you guys respond. So I, I could, I have two options. I could be ashamed and completely ignore that. Or I can cross the line 
and take the step of obedience and call you because I feel like that's what I'm burdened to do. So if, if you feel like that is you, if you feel that burden, if you feel like God's calling you to something greater than just disciples, he's, he might be calling you to a life of ministry. You heard the words of Adam Judson. One day he did die on the mission field. Not only did he die, he buried two of his wives who died on the mission field too. Guys, the call to ministry is not light. It is heavy. It, it could be your very life. It, it is a very public life. People will always look at you, always have criticism, always, want, always think that you have it all figured out. And guys, we don't. If, if that's you, here we go. If you feel called to ministry like that, would you stand up right now? Right now. All your friends aren't looking. Their heads are bowed. If you feel like that's you, would you stand up right now? I want to give my life to something greater. I, I, don't, I don't want to just... I don't want to just be a church member. I want to lead the church. All right, here's, here's verse 26. Are you ready? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. I said this was a very public thing. And so what I'm going to ask, what I'm going to ask, is I want everybody else to, to open their eyes and look around the room. You see some people standing. They're not weird. They're not freaks. But if the call to ministry is something that God has placed on your life, then, then I, I want you to feel like you're really taking a step across the line, okay? And so what I want you to do, you, you can actually look in the back, and it's kind of coincidental that a few extra pastors showed up today. You see Blake back there. You see Pastor Rick back there. Pastor Kyler, Kyler and Casey also showed up. You see a lot of their wives back there who have given their lives to ministry as well. I want you to go ahead and start walking towards them right now. Go ahead. I, I want you to hear from, from Blake and Rick and those guys. What, what does that look like? Go ahead right now. For the rest of us, we're going to sing a few more songs. Three? Three songs? Two songs. We're going to sing two more songs. Two songs. We're going to sing two songs. I'm going to pray for us in just a minute. And I know that God is still working in a lot of your lives. Hey, eyes up here. I know that God is still working in a lot of your lives. I hope in these next two songs that you will really come to an idea of what he, that next step is for you, all right? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that your word is living and active, that it moves in the heart of men. Christ, I thank you that you have given us an invitation to follow you. There's no one else I would rather go after, God. And Jesus, you are the only one. In your name we pray, amen. Let's all stand and sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. My righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see.
to it because I know I am forgiven. The future's sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my part, and he was raised to Have y'all had a good time? Yeah. Come on, lift your voice. Oh, don't lose heart. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. And don't give up. There is hope. There is always hope. Yeah. And there is peace in the storm. In the storm. No, don't forget. He is Lord, He is Lord of all, yeah. Come on, everybody, lift your voice. There is a King of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in His name, yeah. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. Yep. Come on, everybody, let's sing it out. There is the King of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name, yeah. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory.
we sing. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound. Just one name over all. Jesus reigns. I know. Yeah, I know. Let's sing it again. Come on, nations. Nations bow, mountains shake. I know. Come on, all across the room, let's put our hands together like this. Come on. That was awesome. Hey, would you guys thank the band one more time? There's some other people we need to thank too. Would you guys thank your awesome family group leaders as well? Honestly, these are some of the best family group leaders we have ever had, ever. Would you guys thank uh, David and Phil and those guys running the sound booth stuff? And then I don't know if you've noticed like Instagram and Facebook or like the videos we've had, but Austin, Chaney, and Caroline Fogel have like killed our kind of like creative team. We have what you would call the late night snack team, but we have the K team, Lar Church, Aaron, Bailey, Tiffany. Who got a Band-Aid this week? Did anybody get a Band-Aid? No. It's because of the awesome medical team. Would you guys thank the medical team? <laughs> then we have our directors, starting with the top El Presidente, Robin James. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and then we also have Steve and Melissa, Gwen, Fletus, and Emily. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that I have covered everyone except Jeff Riesenberg, Brandon Little, Summer Smith, and Greg Scott, who ran Land Rec. All right. So there's a little reason that I did that, okay? Oh, okay, yeah. And is, is Blake and Allie back there too? Yeah. Okay. All right. And Chad Wolf. Um, hey, so remember when you guys came in because the lightning thing was going off? Yeah. We're almost out of our 30-minute waiting period uh, since it's still like within 10 miles. So I'm going to delay just a little bit longer. But you guys really need to know the instructions for tonight and for tomorrow morning. All right? So go ahead and take a seat. All right. Shh. Hey guys, in a minute, we're gonna try and clear out the barn as best as possible. Not everyone will leave, but we're gonna send high school to the lodge. Is that correct, Robin? Can you give me a thumbs up? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna send high school to the lodge for debrief in just a moment. Middle school, you'll stay here, but you'll stay on the sides, okay? We will have a team that is gonna collect these chairs and put them in the backstage because the people that are leading you worship tonight are gonna lead you in worship tomorrow. They gotta get everything back and ready and set up and get a good night's rest and maybe rest their throats because all of our voices are almost gone. You heard mine crack like seven times. And so we got we to gotta make that happen. 
Okay, that's, that's us to help them. Here's the things that I need you to do. Tonight after debrief, we will have Candy Wars as our um, late night as long as this weather clears and we're good with the okay. So let's just assume that everything ends up good. We'll play Candy Wars. We'll crown the Cooper Cup champion or tribe. Okay, yeah, Shh. hold on, hold on. No, 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 stop. We will then go to our rooms and I need you to do three things tonight. One, I need you to pack up every bit of clothing that you can except for what you will wear tomorrow. Two, I need you to either decide I'm gonna shower tonight or in the morning and I need you to make that happen. And three, I need you to clean up your dorms tonight as best as possible, okay? Say what? Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, shower, clean up, brush your teeth, okay? Do one of those things. Or, okay, and then, and then tomorrow, let me walk through tomorrow. We're gonna wake up real early, right? We agreed to this. We're gonna wake up real early. We're gonna clean up, even more, we're gonna pack, we're gonna clean up our cabin. You cannot leave your living area, whether it's the dorm, bunkhouse, or one of the cabins, you cannot leave it until a Crowder's Ridge employee says that you can because you cleaned it well enough, okay? That means sweeping, cleaning up trash, tying up the trash bag, things like that. Cleaning up, guys, the bathhouses, ladies, the bathhouses, cleaning those up as well. Walking around camp, cleaning that up as well. Okay, so you cannot leave your dorm until you do that. Once when you get the go-ahead, you will leave your dorm and you will drop off luggage at the box trucks. One box truck will be for Mallard Creek students. One box truck will be for Harris Campus students. There will be people there with a roster and you will tell them your name. I am Olivia Stover. Olivia Stover, thank you for your luggage. Your Harris Campus, put it right over there. Olivia, when you get on the bus, you're going to be on Andrew's bus, okay? So you need to remember that, that you'll be on Andrew's bus or Chris's bus or Don's bus or whatever bus. Because then, after that, I know it's a lot of instructions, guys, but it's pretty seamless. After you drop off your luggage, you will go into the dining hall and get breakfast, okay? It's going to be a light breakfast because we got more coming, but it'll be Pop-Tarts, fruit, yogurt, things like that. You'll get that and then, and then get on the bus. Once when you get on the bus that you are assigned to give, we'll read the roster and make sure everyone's there. Then we go on back to church, okay? Then I think really cool, we get to end Camp Paradise with church. Like, I think that's pretty cool. We get to take all this, okay. Caroline never disappoints to be a cheerleader. We get to take all this energy and fire for the Lord that we feel and celebrate it with our church family in service at the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, okay? I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be a really good time, but we got a lot of work to do to make that happen. Raise your hand if you agree to this. Boy, hold on, that's not what I'm going to say. Say, I, and then state your name. I am <laughs> What? I. <laughs> I agree to clean up. I agree to clean up. My room, bathhouse, and myself. My room, bathhouse, and myself. To put on my camp t-shirt in the morning. To take my luggage to the right truck. To go through the breakfast line quickly. To get on the right bus. To go back to church. And to worship with my family. And then go home and take a nice nap. All right. Okay. Robin. Robin, do you think that was good? Fantastic. El Presidente. Okay. Are we good to let high school go to the lodge for debrief? All right. No? Was that Tucker? Tucker. All right. High school. High school. St wait. All right. High school. Stand up and go to the lodge for debrief. High school only. High school only. High school only.